Hey everybody, welcome to the GMG Review. Today I'm taking a look at indie skirmish game Rain in Hell, Demonic Skirmish Combat, known as the legally distinct Demonic, not Daemonic, from Snarling Badger Studios, um, penned by Adam Loper and Vince Ventrella. Uh, this is a miniatures agnostic skirmish game in the vein of, I guess, Age of Sigmar Warcry or Kill Team, using bands of demonic entities. Uh, who are trying to become the reigning powers in hell. Um, it uses an interesting opposed dice mechanic uh, where an attack pool is uh, negated by a defensive pool, a little bit like Gaslands or Gamma Wolves, um, and is fairly core mechanic light, focusing mostly on narrative gameplay and the accrual of souls uh, to empower your warband and uh, and become the, the champions of the evil afterlife. <laughs> So we got we got a 60 page, a 62 page perfect bound rule book here, um, and it has been laid out by Adam Loper uh, and written by Vince Ventrella and with play feedback from a whole bunch of their uh, like like friends and contributors. So what happens? Well, it's hell. Uh, demons live in hell. They like to come to Earth to mess with us and to try and uh, take people back. They traffic in souls. Uh, what do you need to play? Well, you need a 22 by 30 inch play area. So this is an interesting choice. Basically what they're saying is you can play this on a Warcry table or a Kill Team mat. Um, and there are a variety of mats being made in that size now actually. I think uh, GameMat.eu and somebody else. I remember seeing another one recently who did some Kill Team mats. GameMat actually sent me a couple which was nice. Um, so if you're looking for game mats that are in neoprene as opposed to using the card stuff stuff that uh, the GW sells, you can. But I guess the idea here is that this is going to be compatible or playable by people who are Warhammer fans. Um, I think that, <laughs> which is interesting because it's an indie skirmish game. Uh, and I find that to be an interesting proposition because people who play mainstream GW games this would probably be them foraying into the indie skirmish game, whereas indie skirmish gamers might not actually have a mat in that size and play it on a different size play area. But it is pretty specifically laid out to play on that mat, with the assumption is lots of people have those mats. Um, but I, I think it's interesting because it's like it's trying to cross two Venn diagrams. You have the Venn diagram of people who like indie games who might not have the uh, the access or currently own the thing that you would play this indie game with, and then the idea that this could be the first indie game you try out if you are... Um, more of a mass market gamer. You need some D12s, you need some D6s, you need something to measure in inches, uh, you need some terrain, like three to five pieces of terrain that look like hell <laughs> or something spiky, um, and seven to ten miniatures to be all your, your lesser demons and stuff, but there could be some monsters and terrain and um, like special sort of like character stuff that you might want as well. So what do you need? Uh, you also need, sorry, some uh, objective markers, which should, you know, about an inch across. Uh, you need minion demons, uh, and then we got some concepts here. So active player is the person who's doing something. Uh, you go clockwise around the table, unless otherwise specified. A cabal is your unit of dudes. Uh, devout, a devout demon is part of your cabal and represents the lieutenant advisor or heavy to your leader. So they're like a better upgraded guy. Um, dice, yay, so dice, six-sided and 12-sided. Uh, and then your leader, the leader is your leader of your cabal, and then minions and devouts follow them around. So they're like your, your big, big boss man, and they're usually free. And then you get your minion demons, which are little guys, they come in a bunch of varieties. And then a natural roll is the natural roll of a die roll. So before you reroll anything or, or mess with it. An objective is a thing you're trying to do typically. Um, objective is controlled by uh, having more demons within a certain range of it. This thing will tell you when the timing of control is determined. Uh, souls is the currency of hell. <laughs> um, souls are how you purchase your initial cabal, as well as how you create additional demons. And then soul dies during a game when demons are killed, nearby demons are able to solve it, harvest soul energy. From the slain demon, this barely contained energy is taken in the form of a soul dice, a resource you can use later on, and can be converted into things. So basically, you roll a die and put it to one side, it's a soul dice. Uh, we got some cool black and white art. This is a, a black and white perfect pound book, by the way. Um, and then starting to play, sweet. So, a game of Rain and Hell is divided into rounds. At the beginning of each round, each player will determine the initiative of their cabal uh, and the goals for the scenario. So typically, the scenario is in the back of the book. Each scenario describes how the board should be set up and the victory conditions for that game. So you've got, I think it's 10, and some rules for uh, Fields of Battle. Hang on, they're all at the back here. It is 12, oh, D12, uh, but 10 actual scenarios. So uh, 11, 12, the player with the lowest experience or the fewest cabal members gets to choose which scenario you're gonna play. So 10 different missions you can play through. Uh, and they all have a variety of different player numbers too, which I thought was interesting. So there's a one player mission, but then there's a bunch that are two player, and then some that are two to four. 
Uh, and this is a neat mechanic. So rolling initiative, again, this is a bit like rolling your Warcry dice at the beginning and you count your singles. In this game, you roll a d12 for every one of your models in your warband, your cabal, and you then pair them up highest to lowest. So uh, what would happen is I roll, like, let's say I've got seven guys, roll seven d12. You'd roll your, I don't know, eight d12. And then whoever rolls a 12 is going first. Uh, and then you'd go lower down to there. So uh, what, like the example basically is if you go... Um, 12, you go 12, then you go 11s. Uh, if two people on 11, though, the, you don't get to double activate. So if uh, I get the 12 and get to go first, and then we both roll an 11, you get to do your 11 before mine. That's a tiebreaker to try and make us alternate as opposed to having straight through. And you just keep pairing them off down to see who activates a model. The dice aren't tied to any particular model. It's just basically giving you an activation order um, that's a bit random and throwing some kind of chaos into it. Get a hit, chaos. Um, and then, yeah, that's how you activate over the course of the game. And when you activate, you can do a variety of things. So demons are activated, um, and you activate them in decreasing order. Uh, if you're playing a game with more than two players, then all the players roll dice and proceed as above, but ties proceed clockwise around the table, starting with the player that did not activate last. So it's a bit fiddly, I think, for more than two players. Obviously, with two players, it's going to be relatively simple. I would recommend getting a pile of D12s, which again are weirdly hard to buy individually in two different colors and having that be a, a pool to one side. Uh, end of the round, continue alternating uh, the activations until act activation dice have been used or discarded. The beginning of the next round, repeat the initiative roll and continue this process until a number of rounds have been completed. And then ending the game, the victory uh, conditions will tell you how to do it. Um, or one cabal is uh, choose to retreat because you might want to choose for like your... Um, campaign purposes. Uh, cabals do not always fight it at the bitter end. Oftentimes uh, you want to leave. Before rolling for initiative, if a cabal has lost more than 50% of its members, then they can just choose to retreat. Instead of rolling, all the demons are removed and they're considered a loser for the scenario regardless of the current score. So you might want to leave. When you retreat, if you have any demons that are slain that were carrying relics, you may roll a dice for each slain demon carrying a relic. As a result of one, any relics they were carrying is lost permanently and removed from your cabal. So there is a cost to retreating, basically. It's, but it's a bit like retreating in more time. All right, so building your cabal, how do you do it? Well, uh, you're going to get about 100 souls to do so, uh, and your leader is free. So you first you select your philosophy, and that kind of dictates how you play. So you can be the lords of hell. It's better rain in hell than, wow, well, just it's better rain in hell. The earthbound, hell's over. we got to go back to where the souls are on earth. The demented, those who seek order in this madness are truly insane. So you're going to be madness demon. The brokers, everything's for sale. The judges, we sort of like enact our will. And the empty, they're the nihilists. They're the nihilists, Lebowski. They believe in nothing. Um, and then you create your leader. And your leader can be one of three different archetypes, which you'll go through in a second. Then you're going to add your devout, who's like your crazy like second in command. Uh, let's say he is uh, sort of your, uh, what's his name? Uh, he is the uh, Destro to your Cobra commander, if you will. Uh, then you add your uh, minions, which are like your little baby guys, and they come in different varieties, and then complete your play sheet. So, yeah, who who wants to be who is kind of the thing that's going to separate your warband. So, um, <laughs> I thought this was funny. Splintered Fang was the name of one of the demons in here. <laughs> I get it. Splintered Fang. Um, yeah, and then what you're going to have is your devout demon. So your devout demon is also d dictated by who you have. So like, if you're a Lords of Hell, the Lord of the Pit is your devout demon. If you're Earthbound, the Succubus is one of yours. Uh, the Demented get the Madness demon. The Brokers get the Tallyman. The Judges get the Executioner. And the Empty get the Void demon. And then you list the demons. So, uh, your leader. You get to pick one of three types. You can be a Warrior, a Schemer, or a Zealot. And your cost is always zero. Your move is in inches. Your life is how many hit points take before you die. And your combat is both your attack and defense stats. There's not a lot of stats in this game. Um, they're really only important one is combat uh, and life. So you're a bit tougher and fightier, obviously, if you're a warrior, but not quite as fast. A zealot could be a bit zippier um, and medium fighter, and then a schemer is uh, less fighty, more fast and getting away from things. Then you're devout. They obviously have different, different things. Uh, the Lord of the Pit, he flies, can move eight. Got 12 life in combat seven, so he's a big fighter. The executioner is the biggest fighter. Moves 5, 12 life, and 8 hit points. And you got to think about life as, this is opposed dice rolling, right? So um, the combat mechanic is pretty simple. Let's say my warrior is attacking this, I don't know, zealot. 
Uh, he has a higher combat score, so it's just like rolling a wound in 40k. If you're higher, you roll a, uh, a, a three plus. If you're lower, you're rolling a five plus. If you're equal, you're rolling a four plus. And that's the the sort of like core like opposed dice mechanic for it. And then you roll your dice pool. So if I'm combat seven and I'm attacking, and actually I might have that ratio slightly wrong. It might be two plus three plus four plus. I think actually it is. I think it's not quite as. Yeah, it's two plus two plus four plus. It's not it's not quite the same. So you're you're never hitting on worse than a four plus if your combat ability is worse. But let's say the warrior is attacking the zealot. He's going to roll on two plus seven dice. So he's probably going to get five to six hits. And then the Zealot gets to try and defend, rolling six dice, and every six is a successful defense. So he's going to get one, probably. So he's going to take a lump of five damage every time those guys fight on average dice rolls. You might spike, it might get weird or whatever, but he'll take two to three hits from the Warrior, and hitting back against the Warrior, he's only hitting on fours, so he's going to get three hits, and that guy's going to drop one to two of them. It's way hard for the Zealot to fight the Warrior in melee and come out on top over like two or three rounds. Um, you've got some flying guys, so, and then your lesser demons are all based on whatever you want them to be. You can have a slaughter fiend, a mephit, a tentacle beast, an armored demon, a spine demon, or a corpulent demon. And you can just visualize how much they are. Now you get a hundred to spend. So these are free. Um, the demons are specially chosen and recruited by the leaders sometime over the years. A uh, cabal simply cannot be built uh, with just a leader. One devotes, uh, once the devotes joined and fully believes the philosophy, then um, progress can finally be made. So you're you're getting basically two models for free, and you got a hundred left to spend on the rest of these. You're not getting any greater demons because they're not showing up in um, campaign games in the beginning, or superior demons. But these guys are roughly twenty each. So you're going to have probably seven models. If you're taking like an armor, a couple of armor demons, then the lower ones like the corpulent demons. You're, you're getting seven-ish models in your warband to begin with. Uh, making your leader demon, so you choose your leader type, and you get essences. Uh, so your choose leader customizations. Your leader can choose one essence and one relic from the list below. Note you must uh, select these during creation of your leader, and you may not select them later on. Only your leader can wield this relic during your first battle, though you can pass it on later on. You can also find other relics and things. So like, Essences. Soul of Lightning. Your leader's move goes up by one. Poison Soul. When your leader's making a combat defense roll, if they roll a natural six, the attacker suffers two damage, so bounce buck damage. Uh, plus life. Et uh, Eternal Mind. When you roll your activation dice, you can select one dice and re-roll it if your leader's not been slain. Uh, so you can re-roll your ones, basically. Uh, whatever your low dice roll is to try and get up to 12. Explosive Spirit. If you're slain, you may roll your combat dice. Uh, each roll of four plus does a damage to each team within three because you explode. Mending Soul, uh, when rolling on the Soul Loss table after the battle, determine the fate of your demons. You can reroll one Fate Roll for your Cabal. Skirmishing Spirit, if your leader is running Skirmish, their move is increased by three. Regenerating Soul, heal life. Uh, and then Steadfast Soul, when your leader uses Focus Combat, they can choose to change the result of any one combat die to a six. And then Relic Soul Drinker, uh, each result of six to hit is two damage instead of one. And if this demon's attack slays an enemy demon, they heal. Screaming Shield, uh, never be hit on anything better than a three. That seems like the one to take. Infernal armor, uh, reduce damage by one. Hammer of thunder, when you get a natural dice roll of six for your combat attack, all enemies in three suffer two damage. That one's pretty good too. Axe of black blood, plus one combat score uh, for combat attack rolls, but not defense rolls. Plate of rhyme ice, uh, when you make a combat defense roll, if any uh, dice is a natural six, the enemy reduces their movement uh, score to one, as long as this demon remains within a half inch of that model. So you basically like free somebody. Token of luck, once per round, the demon may roll a single dice roll. This can be used, uh, this may not be used for an initiative roll. And the necklace of adaptation, roll twice when making a check for any terrain and select either result. Boots of leaping, you can fly and when you move, you can ignore the demons. Uh, and then philosophy bonus, when you choose a philosophy, each one lists a bonus for your leader and then you apply it to your leader. So for instance, uh, Lords of the Pit, where is it? Mm. Your philosophy bonus would be, let's say, Lords of Hell, sorry. Uh, your leader bonus, uh, imperious nature. Your leader's natural majesty and power is hard to overcome. Reduce the combat attack of dice uh, of any enemy attacking you by one. So that's pretty cool. So, But it's the attack dice, not the score. So it doesn't change what they roll to hit. It just changes how many dice they roll. And then make your devout demon. Um, they get their special abilities and stuff. So like you get madness demons who are move 5, life 11, combat 3. They're infected with madness once per round when the enemy's making a combat attack roll within 3 of the madness demon. Before the roll is made, they can exchange the combat ability 
of the enemy for your own, which is pretty rad. So they can turn in other people. Void Demons. One with nothing. Once per game when the Void Demon is slain, it is instead not slain. It can be set up uh, anywhere in the board more than three from the enemy. If it's set up in this way, it has five life and can't be healed by any method. Just comes back. And then some suggestions for like making dudes. Minion Demons should be on 25, 32, or 40 mil rounds. Lesser Demons get all these special abilities. Greater Demons, Superior Demons. These are the big guys. And then movement and combat. So, Rain and Hell is focused on brutal, fast-placed combat between demons and hell. When they're activated, that demon may move and fight in any order. To fight, your demon will utilize the following combat ability. So basically, you get to do two things. You move, then you fight. You move your move allowance, then you can fight afterwards. Uh, movement, you're moving your demons as a matter of uh, your movability. Yay! Uh, you may not move twice during a turn, even if you do not fight. Uh, special circumstances do some movement um, to some movement supply below. You can't move through other demons, friend or foe. Fly. If it includes fly, ignore vertical distances when you move. So just like flying in 40k. Climbing. Your demons can move vertically up terrain. If they do so, they move at half speed. Uh, you must end on a horizontal surface. You can ignore a terrain no more than an inch wide and an inch high. Combat. Generally, demons deal with most aspects of the world around by punching it. <laughs> Um, and so when you when you fight, you get to do three different combat skills. This is a kind of a neat thing, and, and I like this as a um, a universal rule as opposed to being a thing that like individual models do. You can running skirmish, charge, or focus. So if you running sur like basically they're running sur skirmish is you do a drive by attack. So you if you come within an inch, then you fight. So meaning if you move six inches, you could move two, fight, and then move the remaining like four inches away, and you can't end within one, which is your engagement engagement range. Charge, you can't charge if you're already engaged. You must end your move within one inch of the enemy and may not move again for any reason. Your combat score increases by one for attacks made at the end of that movement. So basically you move in and stop and then you fight with plus one combat score. And then focus combat, you can't move at all so you're already engaged probably, but your combat score increases by one for attack and defense rolls made until the next um, time you're activated. So that's also when people are attacking you. So basically, you have three stances you can be in when you're fighting, and that's a neat way of like differentiating. Uh, do I want to drive by? Do I want to charge in and like start fighting forever? Or if I'm already engaged, do I want to do my my like attack and defense thing? Uh, or stand on a point. Like you could focus combat when you're not even fighting anybody yet, and wait for people to come charge you and get plus one of your defense uh, rolls. Combat range: it's a half inch horizontally or two inches vertically, measuring base to base. Combat score: it's your combat stat. Um, and then greater than is 2 plus, equal to is 3 plus, uh, and then less than is 4 plus for your combat rolls. Once the TN is determined, you roll your combat dice, uh, and then every score that's a success is a success. Uh, then you make your defense roll, each roll of a 6 is a successful defense, and then everything not defended is a point of damage. Slain demons, if you take enough to equal your life score, you're dead. And then your controlling player removes one of their unspecked activation dice as well. So when you, when you lose a guy, you lose a die. And then soul dice, whenever a demon is slain by a demon you control and one of your demons is within three of it, you can harvest their soul energy. Uh, this is represented by the game by a soul dice. Each time you slay a demon, friend or foe, roll a d6 and place the result on your play sheet. Throughout the course of the game, you can choose to expend these soul dice for bonuses or keep them as additional rewards at the end of the game. If you choose to utilize the soul dice during the game, you may gain one or two benefits. In either event, once a used soul dice, it's expended or removed from your play sheet. You can use the dice and replace any roll made by attack or defense dice with the face value of that dice. So basically, you can use them as like might points into your combat rolls. Either player may replace the dice that's already been replaced by a roll or a soul dice. So you can only replace dice that have been replaced. And then fields of battle. Uh, different types of terrain rolls. So you got ruins. And they have option rolls to be haunted, shrines, swamps. Basically, whatever you can think of being in hell. Forests, pools, crags. Uh, and then a random terrain generator. Randomly generate the terrain. It could be a ruin, a shrine, a swamp, a forest, D3 pools, or D3 crags. If it's a light terrain table, roll three times, medium four times, and heavy five times. Campaign play. So, uh, Rain and Hell is usually played over the course of several different missions in a campaign. Uh, when the game comes to a close, each cabal completes the six steps following. First, the effects of death. Well, you're demons, so you're just going to come back to life probably, but you can lose some soul stuff. Uh, roll on the table for each demon that was slain, and you're rolling 2d6. Um, record, no demon can roll more than once in this table after each battle, unless specifically, uh, sorry, 2d12 rather, unless specified um, by a rule. So on a, on a double one, you get madness. Your combat score is increased by three, <laughs> but you can never gain any more experience or wield a relic, so you go crazy. 
Three to four soul warp. Uh, your ability is reset back to your starting score, so anything you got is lost. Five to six atrophy move life for combat's reduced by two. Weakened move life for combat's reduced by one. Nine to sixteen no effect. Seventeen to nineteen you're twisted. Choose either move life or combat, reduce them by one. Then choose a different stat, increase it by one. Chaos power, roll d3 on a one. Choose either move life or combat, reduce it by one. On the result of two, nothing happens. On the result of three, choose either move life or combat, and increase it by one. So dying can actually be a good thing. Essence gain with a weak soul, a soul shed. Another more powerful soul comes to the fore. One roll once again for the essence for this demon. Uh, they gain the listened, listed essence without having to pay any soul cost. Um, after you determine the outcome of the table above for any slain demon, you can choose to expend one of your soul dice to reroll the 2d12 for that demon. So if you don't like the result, you can spend a soul dice to do it. Once you've rolled all your soul loss, any unspent soul dice become souls and are added to your soul ledger. Each soul dice is worth six souls. Once they're converted in this manner to souls, they can't become soul dice again in any way. So basically, you can save all the soul dice at the end of a game and either turn them into money to hire more or into re-rolls to try and stay alive. Call the weak. Once you roll in the soul loss table for all your demons, you can choose to call the weak. You can choose to sacrifice any demon and any essences the demons had were lost. You gain 50% of the original cost in souls um, in your coffers and they're permanently removed. So you can slay people for half their cost. And then rewards. Uh, when you've completed rolling on the soul loss table and uh, decided any all members of your cabal uh, that have been called, you can then roll once on the reward table below for your cabal. Note the scenario played can make grant you additional rolls in this table. If you generate an essence, it must be applied to a single demon immediately. So like it's 2d12, you get essence table d3 plus one times on a low roll. Uh, no reward in the 10 to 15, 16 to 19, roll once in the relics. So basically low is essence, high is relics, and you can get up to d3 plus one relics. So a lot of like a lot of potential to find stuff and get stuff. Uh, essences can be like increasing your stats. Relics can um, increase your life. It's mostly in the form of like stat bonuses because there's only one real stat, your combat stat, and then additional abilities. So a few give you abilities, mostly they increase your stats. And then titles, you can get cool um, titles for doing your achievements. It's a bit like um, your Xbox Live achievements. So, Region Slayer, slay two different enemy leaders over any number of games. Your combat ability goes up by one when you fight leaders, if you become a Region Slayer. Uh, Usurper, non-leader slays a friendly leader twice over any number of games. This demon becomes the leader. Using the leader's advantage uh, advancement, your leader ability is removed from the warband as per the color weak ability, so you automatically lose your leader, basically. You gain 20 souls for calling the leader, and any relic the relic leader possesses is now owned by this model, but maybe transferred as normal. So basically, if a non-leader kills two leaders, that dude takes over your warband, which is funny. Covetous, possess one relic and at least three essences. This demon can then carry two relics. Yeah, cool names. I like that as a good gimmick, because it means that the in-game actions have some like consequence, but also some benefit. And then advancement. Apply any special experience uh, bonuses granted by the scenario. Each demon gains an experience for completing the battle. Each demon that was not slain gains an additional experience. If you're victorious, the leader gains a bonus experience. And once you've applied the experience above, check uh, against the table below to determine if any of your demons gain a benefit or an advance. So if you're at five, you can increase your move life for combat. 10, gain one essence from the leader essence table at no cost. 15, increase move life for combat by one. 20, gain a relic from the leader relic table. Uh, only if your leader can use this relic, and then 25 increase move life for combat by one. So these are a bit like the ranges of Shadow Deep uh, bracketed experience levels. You don't get to pick which of these. I mean, you pick inside the thing, but these happen in a specific order. So you can't just dump your experience into like upping a single stat. Devote have their own, and then the minions do as well. And then finally, recruitment and expeditions. Once you've completed all the previous steps, you can choose to expend souls on recruiting additional demons or sending demons on expeditions. If your leader has less than 10 experience, you can only recruit lesser demons. If you have 10 or more experience, you can recruit greater um, demons. And in 20 or more, you can get superior demons. All demons are purchased at zero experience. And then you can go do an expedition. Uh, if you pick a rushed expedition, you immediately spend 20 souls and roll a d6. And a 5 plus, you can immediately make a roll in the reward table. On any other result, nothing happens. If you pick a normal expedition, you immediately spend 10 souls at the end of the next battle you complete, as long as at least one demon from your cabal survived, roll a d6 on a 4 plus, you can roll additional time on the reward table. On any other result, nothing happens. So basically you get two results. If you spend, you have to wait for that one, but on a 4 plus you can roll twice on your rewards. And then 10 different scenarios. King of the Hell, Relic Hunter, Desecration, Twins, The Beast, Extracting Power, The Prison, Marked for Death, and The Crystal Towers and Hellstorm. Um, and they're all going to denote basically how you set up, how you win. So King of the Hill is just literally rush to the middle of the table and have the most uh, models there at the end of the game for five rounds. 
Uh, and then you can get a title as a reward, the King of the Hill. If a single demon occupies the central train piece for all five rounds, they become the King of the Hill. As with all titles, only one member of your band can have this title. This demon adds one additional dice to their combat defense rolls when they're on uh, or within train of any kind. So, you get better at defending stuff. Uh, Relic Hunter, um, you're going to place a um, Hell is Littered with Relics, <laughs> players 2 to 4. It's a heavy train roll, so 5 rolls on the train table. Each player deploys their cabal oh, in the deployment area. And then victory conditions, it lasts 5 rounds. The winner of the game is the cabal with the most relics at the end of the game. So you start with 1, right? So if you lose it, uh, and if you retreat, you, you don't have it. So at the end of the game, roll a dice for each relic in your warband. Uh, on a 4+, plus, you can roll one additional time on the relic table. That's cool. Desecration, you're trying to blow up objective markers. The twins, uh, you're trying to carry one into the other or destroy it. Mm. The beast, kill a big monster. This is the one to four one because the monster will attack and there's a little AI for it too. Extracting power. Uh, the, guy, the cabal that is extracting the most souls from the train when the game ends because there's just souls all over the place because all the train's empowered. The prison, uh, marked for death which means there's actually like an asymmetrical mission. See, player two's in the middle and player one's ambushing them. And then Crystal Towers, Hellstorm, and these are all two to four players. And then a brief syllabus of the game. And there you go. So Rain and Hell, Demonic Skirmish Combat. If you're super into demons uh, and want to kind of neat, it's sort of a post-apocalyptic-y, tongue-in-cheek, uh, you know, hell-based game, then this is probably for you. Uh, lots of modeling options. I mean, obviously, you could literally just play with GW Demon models if you want to. Um, but there's cool stuff out there. A lot of uh, old school minis. If you want to find some Hell Dorado miniatures, there's lots of really cool demon models. Um, there's probably quite a few off brand, like Heresy had some cool demon minis. Obviously, Reaper has a million demon models. Uh, I'm trying to think of who else would have some cool demon models. Mm, Malifaux, maybe? You don't need that many. Probably a dozen is going to get get you what you want. Uh, and yeah, there you go. A mini agnostic game from Adam Loper and Vince Venturella. So uh, I'll link it below. Uh, you can check it out online, um, and you can order it. I believe in uh, it's for, it's from War Games Fault. You can order it in Perfect Bound just like this, or in digital format as well. So anyway, big thanks for watching. Big thanks for Adam sending this over for me to check out. Thanks, Adam Ash. All right. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you uh, want to support the channel, of course, like and subscribe and hit the little bell below so you get notifications when I post future content. I do post stuff seven days a week. Uh, if you want to support the channel um, further, you can, of course, buy a t-shirt through Spreadshirt, um, buy a measuring gauge or objective markers from Death Ray Designs, um, or, of course, most importantly, there is Patreon. Patreon is what makes all this possible, uh, keeps the lights on, pays for the studio costs, pays for the equipment, model costs, and everything else, and most importantly, um, puts food in my kids' bellies and a roof over their heads. Uh, big thanks to everyone past, future who supported me. Uh, I do this stuff because of you guys, and of course, I will continue doing it as long as I can.